Here we are. Welcome, welcome, everybody, for our another awesome first Thursday free community webinar with our uh, Studio Petrocore and Pollyanna, our nonprofit organization. Tonight, Chris Cosma is going to be presenting on California native plants for moth and caterp caterpillar. Oh, sorry. And then you just one thing at a time. Okay. We'll yeah, well, I'm getting it. <laughs> okay. Um, there's nobody. Yes, three people waiting. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. Um, so uh we want to thank you for being here tonight. And this is um another opportunity to do uh education with our nonprofit, Pollyanna. Our mission is to educate and empower communities to honor and protect natural living systems. Um some of our board members are here tonight. Craig, if you can wave, and Sanjay, be sure to wave. Lee Adams, be sure to wave. I'm Sean Mastretti. Um, we're with both Studio Petrocore and a uh, for-profit landscape architecture design firm uh, that focuses on whole systems, regenerative uh, approaches to um, the land and waters, and our nonprofit that I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to add a few things into the chat box just so you're aware. It's a lot to look at, upcoming events, ways you can contact Chris, and I'll be doing that halfway through and at the very end as well, so you can all tap into what's coming up. But just to give you a preview of what is coming up between the Studio Petrocore and the Pollyanna events are uh, July 6th, I'll be presenting for the Landscape Expo. I did this for uh, the free Thursday nights, but I'll be doing it again for the Landscape Expo, Designing Whole Systems Gardens. On July 6th as well, in the evening, our next Thursday night meeting is going to be Phenomenal Landscapes Part 2 with Jessica Kung. So if you attended the last one, it was excellent. And she's going to just continue that beautiful story. And July 15th, we are doing an in-person uh, garden tour in Altadena, Pasadena, and La Cañada, where we're going to be touring some of the Whole Systems Gardens, the Studio Petrocore, and uh, I'll allow folks to come in and see these gardens in person midsummer right before the uh well as they're starting to go into their sleepy stage and um that is going to be limited space uh limited space so be sure to sign up and reserve your space before somebody else gets it and on august 3rd i'm gonna go deep with you all on the first thursday night webinar we are going to be redefining egocentric design and of course more events are coming along be sure to share with us um, opportunities uh, or uh, topics that you would love to hear more about. And if you know of a presenter that you love and they do great slideshows and have a great Zoom presence and have an awesome topic, please email us um, our email I just put into the chat. Let us know what you want to hear more of. And it is 7.09, and we're going to get started. Chris Cosma, thank you so much for being here. I made you a co-host, so go ahead and share your screen and take it away. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see my screen here. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and share with you um, what I've been doing to help advance butterfly and moth conservation in California um, through the use of native plants. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside um, here in Southern California. And I'm, I'm in my fifth year at school here and um, hopefully have a, a little less than a year left. and. Uh, most of my dissertation research focuses on the effects of climate change on moth pollination in particular. So I spent a lot of time thinking about moths. Um, and today, throughout this presentation, I want to paint a picture of moths, not as these pests that we know of um, that maybe uh, ruin our clothing or invade our pantries or fly around our heads at night, um, although moths have a bad reputation um, in popular culture for, for many of these things, um, what I want to do today is convince you that moths are actually Im really important components of our ecosystems, including as pollinators of many of our wild and agricultural plants, as well as really critical food sources for birds and bats and a lot of different organisms. So hopefully by the end of today, I can 
convince you that moths are not the bad guys. So we'll come back to moths, but I wanted to start today by talking about a species that I suspect most of you here are familiar with, and that is the monarch butterfly. So the monarch has been getting a lot of attention lately, um, and that's because just last year, the, the migratory monarch butterfly that overwinters here in California was officially declared an endangered species. So the, the monarch that we, we've all grown up uh, and, and know and love is finally officially an endangered species, um, which is both a good and a bad thing. Um, you know, there's extra protection that can occur now with the monarch butterfly. But the reason that the monarch butterfly was listed as an endangered species is a long history of decline. Um, so in this graph here, I'm, I'm showing you the, the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count from 2020. And this is the statewide effort, or actually countrywide effort, to um, tally the, the Western population, again, that overwinters here in California. And uh, the green bars here are showing the population of the Western monarch through time, beginning in 1997. And you can see generally on this graph, there is a downward trend with these this population um, getting lower through time. But in 2020, the population actually plummeted to um, uh, fewer than 2,000 individuals that were counted in that year. And that actually represented an over 99% decline in this population since around the 1980s. But the monarch is also what we call a charismatic species. Um, and like any charismatic species, it's a poster child for a much larger problem. And so just to show you some of these figures here, um, actually around half of all butterfly species in the US that have been assessed are in decline. So that's around two over 200 species of butterflies that are, are declining right now across the country. And actually um, research has found that these declines are most apparent in the Southwest and other parts of the West. So we can see on this heat map here where the, the uh, hotter colors, so the warmer colors here, um, particularly in red, are the areas where butterflies are declining the most. You can see right here in, Cal in a large part of the Southwest, including parts of California, we have a very steep decline in these butterflies. Some other research from Matt Forrester at the University of Nevada, Reno, has found that butterfly abundance is declining by around 1.6% per year in the Western US. Um, and this has been occurring for at least the last four decades. So every year, there's almost 2% less butterflies out there than, there than there were the previous year. And really importantly, they've also found that dozens of Western US butterfly species are even more at risk than the monarch butterfly. And this includes relatively widespread species like the West Coast lady um, pictured here. All right, so taking a step back, we have around 240 butterfly species in California. And we know that right now, on average, they are declining. Um, like I said, I mainly study moths, so I'll be talking a lot about moths today. And so what about the around 5,000 moth species that we have just in California alone? Well, the answer is we don't really know how their populations are doing because unlike butterflies, moths really haven't been studied as thoroughly. But we do have comprehensive data from other parts of the world, including in Great Britain, where they found a 33% decline in moth abundance since 1968. So just around the last 50 years or so. And we can see um, this, this report um, published here, this downward trend um, in, in moth abundance through time. So if I had to guess, I would say that our, our Western moth populations are probably um, not doing so well either. So why do we care about butterflies and moths, which are in the insect order Lepidoptera? Well, one of the reasons we care is because Lepidoptera is one of the most diverse groups of insects. So there are around 14,000 butterfly and moth species in North America alone. And 
Something that's often met with surprise is the vast majority of those species are moths and not butterflies. So moths are actually around 10 times more diverse than butterflies. And this is our phylogenetic tree here for the order Lepidopter, where we have just the evolutionary relatedness between all of the butterflies and moths in this order. And we can see that just this small highlighted part here is our butterflies. Everything else in this order are moths. So they're really, really diverse, and they're also really, really important components of our terrestrial food web. So as caterpillars, so the larval stage of butterflies and moths, um, they're herbivores. So they're eating those plants, taking in that plant energy. And then as caterpillars and also as adults, they are um, really important food sources for birds and bats and all sorts of other organisms. And actually in these two roles as herbivores and then as prey, Lepidoptera transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So again, they're really, really important for taking in that plant energy, those primary producers, and transferring it up the food webs. So we can think about the structure of our, our ecosystems where we have plants on the bottom as, as our primary producers. The only way that plant energy makes it to the rest of the food chains is through the action of herbivory. So again, we have those caterpillars and other insects and other groups of herbivores that are taking in that plant energy. And in turn, they're eaten by the higher level consumers like our birds and our bats. So I really think that part of this whole equation here is rethinking the way we we approach herbivory. So herbivory is often vilified as something that is, you know, really bad and terrible for our garden. And it's something that historically we've spent a lot of time combating with pesticides um, and other methods that ultimately kill off these important insects. So I really think that part of this whole equation, again, is, is rethinking that relationship and maybe being okay when we see signs of herbivory in our garden, or maybe even seeing that as a good thing as us, as humans, and the ones who are providing these plants, um, playing a part in supporting our local food webs. All right, so I mentioned that caterpillars are really important food sources for a lot of different organisms. And just in, as an example here, some work by Doug Tallamy, which I know Sean is, is a fan of here. Um, Doug Tallamy's found that caterpillars can make up to 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. So they're probably the single most important source of food for, for many of our native songbirds in the US. And also, um, you know, it's not just birds. We have bats that are moth specialists, and that means they almost exclusively eat moths for their diet. And so it's really no surprise, given these facts, that Lepidoptera declines have been linked to the to the decline in our native songbirds and bats in the US. So as another example from Doug Tallamy's research, they found that insectivorous birds, so birds that predominantly eat insects, have declined by 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years, whereas non-insect eating birds have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals. So this is pretty compelling evidence that the precipitous decline that we're seeing in birds right now in the US is, is very closely linked to the decline of insects, and in particular, butterflies and moths. All right, so they're important food sources, um, but they're also really important pollinators, and butterflies get most of the attention here. We all know that during the day, butterflies are flying around, visiting our flowers, transferring pollen from flower to flower, um, but it turns out that moths are actually probably even better at pollinating. Um, including uh, both wild and agricultural plants. So there's a mounting body of evidence pointing to the fact that moths are really important pollinators of entire plant communities. And some examples of that are recently um, studies have found that pollen, uh, moths help pollinate avocados. So if you like avocados, thank the moths. Um, berries as well, apples. And although I can't find much support for this in the literature, I suspect that moths are also helping pollinate uh, citrus because I've documented in my very own backyard moths visiting the, the orange flowers of my orange tree. So here's just a video showing that, that moth going to town on those citrus flowers.
All right, so they're important for agriculture, but we also know that moths, including right here in California, are really important pollinators of our wild plants. And that includes famous examples like, like the yucca yucca moth interaction and hawk moth pollination of datura species, evening primrose species, as well as agave species. So we have a lot of examples right here um, in California of, of moths um, pollinating our native plants. And actually, in some of my other research that I'm not going to talk about today, I found that around 60% of all moths in our Southern California habitats are transporting pollen, um, likely of our native as potentially also agricultural plants. So this is, you know, a boring little gray brown moth that most people would never even pay attention to. This is all of the pollen that that moth was carrying on its proboscis. So all of these little grains are pollen grains. So again, they're, they're out there, they're flying around, they're helping pollinate our plants. And it's not just those big charismatic hawk moths or the, the hummingbird moths that many of you are probably familiar with. Again, it's, it's little boring, um, you know, indiscreet moths like this. All right. So, you know, Moth, butterflies and moths are, are not doing so well, like many of our, our groups of insects. Um, why are they so impacted? Well, turns out that that's a pretty hard question to answer. Um, David Wagner, um, a, an entomologist from the East Coast in 2021, described uh, the global threats to insects as death by a thousand cuts. And this is essentially the idea that there are just so many things being thrown at insects from all sides that it's often really hard to determine the single leading cause behind a decline in any species. And more often than not, it's probably a combination of many interacting factors. And those include everything from habitat loss to introduce an invasive species to pollution, including light pollution, which is really bad for nocturnal organisms like moths. Then we have pesticides used in our agricultural fields, but also the pesticides that we use at our own houses. And then we have the myriad effects of climate change, which includes everything from increased droughts and wildfires to the increased intensity of storms. All of these things are affecting our native insects. And so just like bees and other groups of insects that you may have heard, moths and butterflies are being affected by all of these different stressors. Um, but another thing that we know about butterflies and moths in particular is that they rely very closely on specific native plant species. So the monarch butterfly has taught us this. And, and many of you are familiar with the fact that monarchs need milkweed plants. And the monarch is what we call a host plant specialist. It specializes on a specific type of plant, the milkweed. Um, and we know that specialist species are often at greater risk of extinction under environmental uh, under environmental change, in part because they're more easily decoupled from these resources that they rely on. So on the other side of the spectrum, just as an example here, let's say we have an ecological generalist. And a generalist species is one that can rely on many different resources. Like in the case of caterpillars, maybe a, a species that can rely on dozens of, of host plants. Um, the local extinction or loss of any one of those plant species is not likely to greatly affect that generalist because it has all of those alternative partners to rely on. But when we take an ecological specialist like the monarch butterfly, that same local loss of that species is likely to have a great effect on that specialist because it's the only resource it can rely on in its landscape. And so the monarch butterfly is not alone in its host plant specialization. We actually know that around 90% of all plant eating insects are host plant specialists, just like the monarch butterfly. And this includes also the vast majority of butterflies and moths. And this brings up an important point about the definition of the word native. And I, I like to illustrate this. And this is again from um, the work of Doug Tallamy, specifically the book, The Living Landscape. Um, so if you haven't, you, you should check that book out as well. Um, and they define native as a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. 
And so the reason I really like this definition is it because it brings attention to the fact that it takes a really, really long time for these interactions between our native plants and our native insects to develop. And that's why they're so specialized. And also that's why they're so delicate. And so it, it emphasizes again that we need to be planting these specific host, native host plants to support our native insects as a monarch butterfly has taught us. But one thing I also wanna emphasize is that it's not just about host plants. Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. So we, uh, the caterpillars and, and the host plants that they eat get a lot of attention, but I'm gonna review the, the Lepidoptera life cycle here to remind everyone why these organisms need plant species at each life stage. And so our eggs are deposited on, on native host plants. The caterpillars, again, are, are often highly specialized on those native hosts, often only able to eat a few species. Um, even things like chrysalis and cocoon placement benefit from diverse native plant resources. And then we're also learning more about um, how there are specialized relationships even at the adult stage. So adult butterflies and moths rely on flower nectar as their fuel and their food. And the, a growing body of research is showing that native plants are often more attractive to them and also more nourishing. So provide better nutritional content to our native insects. So just looking at these two life stages, the larval stage or the caterpillars and our adults, it becomes very clear that Lepidopter need both their native hosts and their nectar plants. Again, the host plants are those plants that are eaten by caterpillars and nectar plants are those plants that are visited and often pollinated by our adult butterflies and moths. And so in light of this understanding, it's, it's no surprise that Lepidopter declines are driven by the loss of native hosts and nectar plants due to things like habitat destruction and climate change and all of those other stressors that I, I mentioned earlier. All right. So that's a lot of bad news. Um, now I wanna transition into the good news, which is what we can do about it. And there's a part we all have to play in this. And we know that part of that is planting native plants. Um, native plants support up to 15 times more native Lepidopter species than introduced in ornamental plants. Again, partly due to those co-evolved relationships that take millions of years to develop. And any yard or garden can be an important insect waste station. So just taking the monarch butterfly as an example again, they found that milkweed gardens on private land can and do contribute to effective monarch conservation. So we see a lot of um, things centered around the monarch butterfly, save the monarchs, plant milkweed, do not spray pesticides. But I think we can all improve the way we plant native for insect conservation. I'm going to explain what I mean by that here. So the monarch butterfly is at risk, so we plant milkweed, and there's a lot of effort around this. But we can see that as the list of threatened Lepidopter species grows larger and larger, the list of native plants that we need to support them also grows. And so effective Lepidopter conservation means moving from this restricted focus on individual species and interactions to considering entire communities of threatened Lepidopter species because entire communities of Lepidopter species are threatened. So one of the ways we can do that is by using what's called an ecological network approach. And ecological networks just describe the interactions between entire communities of plants and the insects that rely on them. And through analyzing these sorts of networks, we can identify species that are disproportionately important and also ones that are more vulnerable. And this can help us prioritize species for conservation. And so that may include our specialist insects like the monarch butterfly that's um, in a, pre a precarious position, right? Because it, it relies on very few native plant species in the landscape. But it could also mean generalist plant species that support many insects instead of just one or two. And so what I've done in this project that I'll talk about today is I've taken a, a massive data set um, that details the interactions between butterflies and moths and their native California hosts and nectar plants in California. And in this data set, we have around 2,000 Lepidopter species, 2,000 native plant species, and 14,000 unique interactions 
um, that have been recorded. So what I've done is I've sort of funneled all of this data into a web application called the Butterfly Net. Um, and I think Sean can drop the link in the chat. Um, so this is a web application. It works on a mobile device, but it works much better on a computer or a, or a tablet. Um, and so this app will help you find the best native hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths anywhere in California. I'm going to sort of go through how I built this app and how to use it in the rest of this talk. So what you'll see when you open this app is um, a map. And so what you'll do is input your address or you can even click on the location on the map and then you're gonna hit find plants. One of the first things it's gonna tell you is which eco region you're a part of. And I'll explain what eco regions are in a second. And then you're also gonna be able to select a habitat type. So oftentimes when we, when we do restoration and native plant gardening, we're sort of trying to emulate a natural type of habitat. So you can choose of the ones that are around you, which one you're most, uh, you would most like to emulate. Um, and then you can also choose to focus on just host plants, just the nectar plants or both, and for just butterflies, just moths or both. And then what it's going to do is show you a list of prioritized plant species. So um, by default, it's going to show you the first 10, but you can also increase the number of species that it shows you. Um, and these are going to be the species towards the top of the list that are the best for supporting butterflies and moths in your area. And so I'll explain what the highlights mean as well in a second. And it's also going to show you a visualization of your local interaction network. So these are just the um, insect and plant species in both the larval and adult stages that are interacting near you. And really what we're looking at here are our caterpillar host plant networks. So how the caterpillars are interacting with their native host plants and then how our adult butterflies and moths are visiting the native nectar plants. And through analyzing this data, I've arrived at three important considerations to better protect entire communities of threatened butterflies and moths in California. And number one, we have to plant native host and nectar plants. Number two, we have to prioritize the most important plant species. And number three, we have to consider geographic variation in species and interactions. And I'm going to go through each one of these points. So starting with point number one, why we have to plant native hosts and nectar plants. So in native plant gardening and habitat restoration, we see a lot of focus on pollinator gardens. Um, like this sign here that's um, uh, encouraging or describing that this area has been planted with these pollinator friendly plants, which are often these showy floral resources that attract bees and butterflies and other adult pollinators. And on the other side of the spectrum, as in the case of the monarch butterfly, we have a focus on just planting the host plants for the caterpillar, so the larval stage, um, like this sign shows here. But like I showed earlier, butterflies and moths rely on native plants at each life stage, not just when they're caterpillars, not just when they're adults, but to complete the entire life stage, we have to be providing both of those. So just looking again at the caterpillar and adult stage, some research has found that for the monarch butterfly, the loss of their nectar plants could actually contribute more to their decline than the loss of their milkweed host plants. And so this is just drawing attention to the fact that conservation efforts and native gardening efforts have to consider resource dependencies at each life stage. And so again, we have a really valuable resource here with this data set to explore these interactions at multiple insect life stages. And what I found is that the caterpillars are more specialized than adults. So in the caterpillar host plant network, we have an average of 3.6 host plants per species. Whereas in the adult nectar plant network, so the adult butterflies and moths visiting their nectar plants, we have an average of 14.7 nectar plants per species. So we can see here that caterpillars are much more specialized on a, a, a fewer uh, a smaller subset of the native plant community. And this actually also means that caterpillars are more sensitive to, to plant extinctions. So what I've done is um, use a computer program to simulate plant extinctions where we just take individual plant species out of that network and we see what happens to the rest of the community as a result. 
And in the Caterpillar host plant network, I found that it only takes an average of 1.4 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. Whereas in the adult nectar plant network, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. So we're seeing here that the caterpillars are much more sensitive to potential loss of their host plants. And so again, this draws attention to the fact that butterflies and moths are host plant specialists as caterpillars. And it's not just the monarch butterfly, 43% of Lepidopter species in California have just one host plant based on the data that we have. And a full 73% have just three or fewer host plants. So again, the vast majority of caterpillars are specialized and that again, emphasizes the need to plant these specific host plant species. But I did also want to mention that it's not as clear cut as providing, you know, those, those specialized resources for the caterpillars because Lepidoptera actually use discrete host and nectar plants. So what that means is as caterpillars, um, they're using a different subset of our total plant community as they're then visiting as adults. So this again emphasizes the need that we need to provide both plant species because you could plant all the best host plants and maybe not be supplying good nectar plants and vice versa. So wh whereas we see an emphasis on pollinator habitat for our adults or our, our milkweed gardens for our caterpillars, really effective Lepidopter conservation means protecting both those native hosts and nectar plants. And this is a sign from the UCR Botanic Garden that emphasizes this important fact. And it all comes down to this idea based around the Lepidopter life stage that without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or the moth and vice versa. So if we don't support our caterpillars, we're not gonna get new generations uh, of adult butterflies and moths and, and vice versa. So we don't support our adults with their nectar plants, we're not gonna get new caterpillars. So concluding this section, while the caterpillar stage is more specialized and more vulnerable to plant species losses, I, we also found that Lepidoptera use discrete hosts and nectar plants and this emphasizes the importance of planting both to support the entire Lepidoptera life cycle. All right, moving along to point number two, prioritizing the most important plant species. So I think we're all aware that California is a massive state and we have a lot of diversity here. So we're actually one of Earth's biodiversity hotspots and we have around 6,500 native or endemic plant species in the state. And out of those, we have around 2,000 included in this data set as known Lepidoptera host and nectar plants. And so that still gives us a lot of species to choose from. And I highly doubt anyone is planting 2,000 native plant species in their yard. So we have to do some prioritizing here. And so the way that I've approached prioritizing plant species for Lepidoptera is coming back to a really important concept in ecology called the keystone species concept. And this is basically the idea that there are few species out there that play disproportionately important roles in supporting the stability of the entire community or ecosystem. And the metaphor here is the keystone in a Roman arch, which holds the rest of it together. And so what I found is that few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species. So when we take our entire plant community, just 32% of those host plants support 90% of Lepidopter species, and just 9% of our nectar plants support that 90% of Lepidopter species. So these are the subset of plants that are doing the most work out there for our butterflies and moths, and these are the most important to support um, and plant. But we can actually take this even a step further, and this is some complicated science-y network analysis stuff that I'll explain quickly here. So what I'm doing here is taking these ecological networks that I've described and analyzing patterns within them. And one of those patterns is called modularity, where we have groups of species in these networks that are interacting more closely with one another than other species. So these are sort of, if we if this is our whole network, these shaded regions are these modules of more closely interacting species. And within these modules, two important roles have been established. Module hubs, which are species that are highly connected within their own module, shown here in red. 
and module connectors, which are species that help connect different modules to one another. And these roles are important because when we lose these, we lose a lot of other species as a result. So the loss of these modules, hu module hubs and connectors leads to what we call cascading extinctions, where many other species are lost in the network. And so when you see this list of prioritized plant species, the way that these species were selected was based on this network modularity analysis. So these are our keystone species that are the most important at supporting the stability of the community overall. And I mentioned I would explain what these blue highlights are. So you may be wondering what's going on with these. Well, the blue highlight means that this plant species is supporting a state or federally recognized threatened or endangered Lepidopter species. And so I want to emphasize here that this sort of community level plant ranking system, um, this keystone species ranking system does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened species. So again, I'm going to come back to the monarch as, as the example of this. Although we know milkweed, Asclepius species, uh, as the monarch plant, turns out that in California, Asclepius milkweed species are supporting at least four Lepidopter species as a host plant and 104 Lepidopter species as a nectar plant. So milkweed in particular are really, really important nectar plants. So aside from hosting the monarch butterfly, they're actually playing a keystone role in these ecosystems and are often near the top of these ranked lists. All right, so summarizing point number two here, we found that few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species and that this community level plant ranking system does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened Lepidopter species. All right, finally, point number three, the importance of considering geographic variation in species and interactions. So again, California is a massive state and as part of that size and diversity, we have a, a stunning diversity of not only species across the state, but of habitat types and of interactions between species. And all of these things vary with things like latitude and elevation and distance from coast. And so I'm gonna come back here to the monarch as an example of this. We, we know that these species are varying geographically in their ranges. And so in California, there are actually um, around 15 native milkweed species. And so the colors here are showing each species range roughly across the state of California. And we, we've come to, to realize uh, specifically with regard to the milk, uh, the monarch and milkweed relationship, that it's really important actually to plant your local native milkweed species. So the milkweed species that are as native specifically to your area of California. And we can, we can extend, so the reasoning behind this is partly because um, the, the use of milkweed species that are not native to your area uh, can actually confuse monarch migration patterns. So when that species is not in the correct phenophase, it's not in bloom when it's supposed to in your area, then that can actually confuse um, their migration. It can ultimately um, lead to, uh, is one of the factors leading to the declines. Um, and so we can extend the same idea to the entire community of butterflies and moths. And what I've done is I've taken California's ecoregions, and ecoregions are just areas of similar climatic conditions and similar types of ecosystems. So, for example, here in Southern California, we're in the Southern California, Northern Baja Coast ecoregion. And so wherever you are in California, there's in, in one of these ecoregions, there's gonna also be a variety of different habitat types that occur around you. And so I was in San Jose when I, when I made this presentation um, at the CMPS conference. And so for, for that example, we have in San Jose, everything from mixed chaparral to different types of grasslands. And we have many of the same ecosystems in Southern California as well. And in those ecosystems, there's going to be plant and lepidopter species represented by the dots here. And some of these species are going to be restricted to specific habitat types because they're 
habitat specialist. Some of those species are going to occur across many different habitats. So what I've done is I've layered sort of these ecoregions and habitats with the species occurrence data. So where we're finding each one of these plant and lepidopter species. And that allows me to extract just the local interaction network comprised of just the species that occur in that habitat type and interact there. And so anytime you're using this tool and you select your location, it's gonna be showing you your local interaction type just composed of the native plant species and butterfly and moth species that interact there around you. And so just like the monarch butterfly, it's important to recognize that these communities of plants and insects are shifting across the state. So we have a different composition of species across the state. And this affects how important the plants are in those communities. So the, the plants that are important in Northern California are not necessarily gonna be the same plants that are important for butterflies and moths down here in Southern California. And indeed I found in this research that the identity of these keystone plant species varies significantly between these California ecoregions and habitat types. And so that makes a lot of sense when we zoom in on how individual species are varying in their importance across the landscape. So in this figure, I'm just showing our California ecoregions on the x-axis organized roughly from north to south. And on the y-axis, I have this metric of plant importance, um, which is calculated from that network modularity analysis. It's on a scale of zero to one. So the closer to one, the more important that plant is. We can see when we plot when we plot individual plant species on this graph that they're varying in how important they are in these different ecoregions. So we see that this is not a straight line across the graph. And in fact, this is significant uh, variation in this in ecological importance as we move across the state. So this is yarrow just as an example. So yarrow is varying in how important it is. We can see it's pretty consistently a, a pretty good plant. You can see as I plant as I plot more plant as I plot more plants, that's a mouthful on this graph, we can see that different species are going to be differentially important in different parts of their range. So we can see our narrow leaf milkweed actually becomes uh, more important in the southern part of its range. And then we can see that uh, chamise is actually becoming less important in the southern part of its range. And then finally, we have mugwort, um, which has a different pattern. And another thing I want to point out here again is that these plants are all varying in relation to one another between how important they are. So again, yarrow at the top here is because consistently a pretty good host and nectar plant for Lepidoptera, whereas mugwort, although it's a great plant for other purposes, it's not the best Lepidoptera hosts or nectar plant. All right, so concluding this section, the identity of those keystone plant species varies significantly between California ecoregions and habitat types, and the importance of individual plant species for Lepidoptera varies significantly throughout the landscape. And this all is emphasizing the importance in considering that geographic variation in species and interactions when we're selecting these plants. All right, so how am I doing on time? Um, let me go ahead and open it up. Well, I'll skip to the end now. And as, as part of the, the discussion, I can go through uh, some pretty pictures for you later. But I'm going to go ahead and skip to the end of my presentation where I am circling back again to our friend, the monarch butterfly. And at the beginning of this talk, I told you that there was a pretty drastic plummet in this population in 2020, where, where there were fewer than 2,000 individual monarchs recorded. Um, well, the good news of this story is that the population is recovering. So in 2021, they recorded over 200,000 individuals. So that's an over 100-fold increase in, in this population just in one year. And then just this past this past Thanksgiving in 2022, they recorded even more, over 300,000 individual monarchs. So um, part of this success is attributed to milkweed and nectar plant planting efforts. So this is just to show you that this really does make a difference. Um, but I hope I've shown you here today that it's not just the monarch butterfly that's threatened. And with tools like mine, we can all help support entire communities of threatened butterflies and moths. And so with, before I end, I'd also like to mention that the butterfly net is a work in progress. Um, 
So there are errors in the data. So if you notice something that doesn't look right or a species that doesn't belong there, please uh, send me a comment. Uh, you can email me my emails here and I think Sean can also put it in the chat. Um, and there are also links on the app website itself to, to submit anonymous feedback. Um, something I'm really excited about that I'd like to share is I recently received a substantial uh, amount of funding to uh, start a working group. So I'm starting uh, a working group through NCS, which is a, a ecological analysis center in Santa Barbara. And we are starting up in September with a 15 person interdisciplinary and cross sectoral working group composed of ecologists and other scientists like myself, and also people from the native landscaping realm and conservation practitioners. And we're gonna work to extend this idea that I've, I've established here with the butterfly net to the rest of the United States, so outside of California. We're also gonna incorporate bees and other groups of insects. So again, I'm focusing on butterflies and moths with this app, but there's a lot of other insects out there that also need help. And this is ultimately a partnership with um, CMPS and Calscape who I've been working with for around a year now to, to integrate this sort of stuff into their systems as well. Um, so if you know of any plant insect interaction or species location data sets, those are, are uh, very much needed as part of this project. So send them my way. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me so much on this project, um, including uh, my lab members, uh, my PI, Nicole Rafferty, uh, Jeffrey Caldwell for this amazing data set and uh, my collaborators, as well as all of the undergraduates who have helped me at UC Riverside um, in, in uh, establishing this tool. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I mean, I was about to say, get this man some more money. <laughs> and look at that. It happened. So, um, uh, yeah, Doug Tallamy writes in his book, Nature's Best Hope. This is a fantastic book. I highly recommend. He mentions if there were two insect populations that we could be focusing on right now, it's caterpillars and bees. So Chris has got the caterpillars covered. Let's find someone to do a presentation on the bees, right? So, um, wow, this, uh, I just absolutely love this tool. As you were talking, of course, I had it up on my screen and I'm playing with it and nerding out. Um, it's I'm super, wonderful, Chris. It's I, just wonderful. I'm, I'm super excited about it. And I know that there's some questions. We're going to get to those really quickly. If you were to list off the top five plants for Southern California, you know, I know this is a lot. Uh, th th there's so many out there, but like, what are the go-tos? Yeah, so that's a great question. And luckily it's the part that I didn't really get to. So it, it's a tough question to answer because like um, part of this whole idea is that we, we really need to get pretty specific based on where we're living and in, in terms of which plants we're choosing. Um, so for a region like all of Southern California, um, some of these are not going to maybe be relevant to where you might live, but I'm going to assume most of us on, on the Zoom call today are, are from Southern California. So just sort of starting with the best butterfly nectar plants, um, we have a list of including bitter dogbane, so the bitter dogbane, and some of these may not be plants, again, that are traditionally used in a landscaping setting. So if you see something that's like, oh, like, I've never seen anyone plant that in their yard, it's partly because we don't usually make these planting decisions with the insects as our, our primary concern. Um, so the bitter dogman uh, provides nectar for the pygmy blue, among other butterflies. We have common yarrow. So yarrow is always going to show up on these lists. Yarrow is a super, super important nectar and host plant. So as part of that top five that you asked for, Sean, I would always include yarrow, um, including uh, providing nectar for the variable checker spot butterfly. Then we have a really interesting plant, salt heliotrope, that turns out to be very important as a nectar source for butterflies, including for the gray hair streak. And then we have different types of buckwheat, including California buckwheat, which is um, a nectar source for many butterflies, including the threatened Hermes copper, which I believe, now I'm forgetting, I think it's in, in San Diego somewhere, the Hermes copper. 
And then kind of skipping around this list, uh, we have desert lavender. If you live in a more deserty area, great nectar plant for many butterflies, including the Kino checker spot pictured here. All right, moving on to host plants um, for butterflies. So we have deerweed hosts the funereal dusky wing, including um, many other butterflies. We have, again, California buckwheat, really important host plant as well, including for the bear's metal mark caterpillar we see here. Um, this one's interesting. Another type of buckwheat, naked buckwheat, which is, you may not be able to see it in this picture, but it's hosting our Pacific dotted blue here, this tiny little, doesn't even look like a caterpillar, kind of just looks like a grub, but there he is. Um, and then we have chemise, which is um, a nectar plant as well as a host plant. Um, and uh, uh, including for some, some threatened species. All right, so moving on to moths. That was for our butterflies, for our moths. Um, some great nectar plants are uh, rubber rabbit brush or camaria species, um, which is a nectar source for the white line sphinx. Also for the white line sphinx and other moths, uh, sage is a great moth plant. I have a lot of sage growing in my yard and I always see the, the daytime flying moths like the white line sphinx out there as well as moths visiting at night. Um, and then we have yarrow again. Um, I mentioned yarrow is a great plant and it also is providing resources for moths like our really cool looking plume moth here. All right, and then finally moving on to our moth host plants in Southern California, Western chokecherry prunus, and there's other prunus species too. Generally, prunus is a great genus for moths as a host plant. Um, here's our small-eyed sphinx caterpillar, another type of hawk moth that's being hosted on the choke cherry. Um, snowberry is uh, one of my favorite plants in part because it hosts one of my favorite moths, the California clear wing. So these are um, also a type of hawk moth that actually have clear wings. Um, so they're really cool looking. And then again, we have California buckwheat, which is hosting, uh, well, another camouflage moth here, the wavy lined emerald or camouflage looper. You may not be able to even see it in this picture, very camouflage, but here's another picture where you can actually see that caterpillar a little bit better. Um, the coloration is, is just strikingly similar to the the buckwheat here. Um, and here's another buckwheat species, a sea cliff buckwheat. If you happen to live near El Segundo, um, maybe you'll be lucky and be able to host the El Segundo blue, which is only known from a single dune system in El Segundo. So it's it's not likely that you'll be able to attract this, but here's another camouflage. Um, and this is a highly endangered um, butterfly species. Uh, so I just wanted to I just wanted to put that one out, even though it's not a moth. Um, all right, so that hopefully that provided a good answer. That was to awesome. That was awesome. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. Questions, questions, questions. Uh, Todd, you had a question. Why don't you sign on and ask your question? Yeah, uh, can you hear me all right? Can you speak up? Uh, I'll try to. You hear me? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I mean that was that was literally incredible. I mean, <laughs> my my jaw is dropping. Like it was so cool to hear all the statistics. Um, you know, as, as somebody that went to UC Santa Cruz and watching uh, the monarch butterflies at Natural Bridges State Park, I mean. Yeah, I had no idea. I thought I knew about butterflies, but I didn't. Um, so anyway, my, my question is kind of a two-parter. Um, do you have any resources for identification? Like you said, five thousand species, but like I, I don't I don't know what I'm looking at, you know. And I've never heard of a, a identification book. Um, yeah, so. I mean, a great resource that I would recommend for identification and also just for documenting what sort of species are around you is iNaturalist. Um, this is a community science uh, website and also an app. Uh, that's actually, so I do a lot of identification work professionally in, in my job for moths and iNaturalist is one of my go-to resources. Um, and so you can- 
you can put in your location and you can choose the type of organism you're looking for and you can see all of the butterflies or moths or whatever that occur right around you. Interesting. Um, and, and did you derive a lot of your data from iNaturalist? Uh, so yes, actually a lot of the location data. So this app relies very heavily on this like geographic location data and, and a lot of that comes from iNaturalist. So um, actually as, as part of the working group that I mentioned I, I got funding for, we're partnering with people who are involved with iNaturalist and other community science um, because, you know, improving these tools means we need more of that type of data. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I know there's some like kind of ethical concerns around, um, you know, crowdsourced data, data sources. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky subject. It's also, it's hard to work with this data to a certain respect because it's, it's collected by, you know, non-professionals for the most part. So there's, there are a lot of errors in it. Um, it takes some extra time to actually be able to adapt it, but it also gives us a, an amount of data that we just simply could not get for, with individual scientists. 100%. Yeah. And are they using certain books to identify um, to even use iNaturalist? Well, actually, so iNaturalist has a sort of AI deep learning algorithm that they've employed now that can automatically ID a lot of species just based on a picture. Um, so a lot of the, if you, you know, take a picture of a butterfly in your yard and upload it to iNaturalist, chances are they'll be able to actually identify, the, the computer program will be able to identify it for you automatically. But then the other side of iNaturalist is that they have uh, professionals from all over the world, including myself, that go on iNaturalist and ID other people's pictures. So we'll go on and say, I know that species, um, it's this. And so we we can also assign professional IDs to all of the the pictures. Um, but yeah, there's also a lot of different resources um, for both butterflies and moths for identification. One that I would recommend if you're interested in moths is uh, Moths of Western North America by Powell. Um, you can buy it on, you know, online. Um, and then there's, there's tons of field guides for butterflies as well. Wow. Yeah, you just blew my mind. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Chris, just so you know, Todd and Kyle and Giselle, Gisela and Todd are on this. They are they are also Team Petrichor. So I hope they are thoroughly inspired as I am teaching them planting design right now and For sure. yeah. getting, getting them used to using this tool. Um, someone had asked the question about the slides, if they're going to be available. What I can say is that we are recording this and this will be up on the YouTube um, I can't speak to whether or not Chris is uh, sharing his slides. I'm not sure if they're proprietary or not. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to share slides with people. So. Um, yeah. I, so it looks like you can probably just email him directly, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, Thank you, Chris. That's very generous of you. Very. Okay. Um, I know. I have a, 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 a. We had a burning question here at Studio Petrichor. All right. What about uh, selections and cultivars? So let's say you want Ariogonum fasciculatum in your garden, but you have a small garden and it's it can be a massive plant and you want something low. I am a, a huge fan of the Bruce Dickinson variety, which stays under a foot tall and 10 feet wide. It flowers just like a buckwheat, looks just like a buckwheat, except it creeps a little bit more differently. Last time I spoke to you, you said the jury's still out on that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the the jury definitely is still out. I think I, I wish I had a better answer to this question because I I often get this question. But but really, the best answer is we need to do more research on whether these cultivars are serving the same ecological purpose and providing the same ecological value of the species that they were cultivated from. So. Um, I think my opinion is that for the most part, it's probably fine. Um, so I think I would rather people choose a native plant variety that, that gets them to actually plant a native plant versus yeah. deciding, oh, like the, the, the non-cultivar version just doesn't work. So I'm going to pick like a non-native species. Um, yeah. but the, the, so just, 
to offer some insight of, of why the jury is out. The the issue with cult, the potential issue with cultivars is um, that through the cultivation process, certain traits are selected for. Right? It's it's the same. It's the same way we produce like ornamental plants um, that look nothing like their wild relatives that have massive flowers um, because that's what we like visually. But through that process of selection, certain traits that uh, the insects rely on for attraction, for example, may be lost as a byproduct or certain traits that they rely on for nutrition. So maybe there was a certain compound or a certain nutrient that happened to have been bred out of it by accident um, through, through the cultivation process. So there is a body of research suggesting potentially that some cultivars are not providing the same ecological value to native insects. Um, and basically what I've seen is that like it really depends on the, the individual species and the cultivar. So there, there are, you know, for every paper that's showing this cultivar is just as good, there's another showing that this cultivar is actually like either worse or downright bad for the native insects. So there is there is a level of concern there. Um, so I would say if, if you can try to just choose the regular native variety, but like you said, that that's often not practical. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Howard McMinn manzanita, that's a Densiflora species. It's a, I don't know if it's a selection or a cultivar, but I saw when we had that painted lady swarm a few years back, those were all over it. And just this last year, I have a Lepicinia fragrance, the pine, uh, no, no, the island uh, pitcher sage, uh, El Tigre variety. And uh, that that plume moth that you showed me, I couldn't figure it out. There were caterpillars all over it, munching on it. I was so excited that my my plant was absolutely destroyed by these caterpillars. And then I posted it on iNaturalist, and uh, it was the plume moth caterpillar. I was super excited to see that in my garden. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I don't think that they're that picky. Right. Give me some food. Right. Yeah. It's it's pretty good evidence when you see a swarm that they're still enjoying the plant. So. <laughs> All right. B. Taylor, I'm so glad you brought this up because I was going to talk about it, too. Tropical milkweed. Can you talk about the Brazilian or the, the South American milkweeds? Yeah, definitely. So uh, with the caveat that I am I am not a butterfly expert and I'm definitely not a monarch butterfly expert, but I do know a fair amount um uh through my research so so like you said in in your comment the 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 concern here in in the US in general not just in California is is partly because of the parasite OE which has a long scientific name that I can't pronounce um it, it's a parasite that is is definitely bad for the monarch is definitely a contributing contributing factor in their uh ongoing decline um, and it's it's pretty well established at this point that the use of tropical milkweed in certain areas is definitely increasing the risk of spreading that parasite. And so I say in certain areas because there's also a, a body, a school of thought that as long as the, the tropical milkweed dies out in the winter, then it's fine because part of the die-out process of our native milkweed, it helps avoid the carryover of, of those harmful parasites. So there's there's a thought that in climates where the, the tropical milkweed will die out in the winter completely, or if you manually cut it down, then it's okay. But again, there are other people who think that that is absolutely not the case and that it's bad to use it regardless. So um, I think my opinion on the matter is that if you have the resources to purchase and find a native species of milkweed, you may as well do that and avoid any potential um, potential negatives with the tropical milkweed. Um, and, and that's also simply because nowadays online and through nurseries, there are a lot of options. Again, like I mentioned in California, we have 15 native milkweed species. Um, so there's a lot to choose from. 
And uh, it can be sort of fun to see which variety you, you can actually get to grow because that's one of the other issues is the tropical milkweed is partly popular because it's very easy to grow and the native milkweeds are not quite as easy. But, um, but from an ecological perspective, yes, the, the tropical milkweed can, is definitely bad news in terms of the parasite. The other thing that I'll mention about the tropical milkweed is that um, it can confuse monarch migration patterns. So it's a tropical species. It, it is not native to, to the, the United States, which means that it's going to be in bloom during a period of time where the native milkweed varieties are not in bloom. And um, it's going to be leafing out during a period of time that the native varieties are not doing that. And all of those sort of what we call phenophases, um, these, the sort of life stages of the plant itself throughout the season, all of those are signals to insects and in what they should be doing. Oh, I should be, you know, migrating right now. All of, all of the plants are, are gone. Um, or, you know, oh, I should be ovipositing. The milkweed is, is leafing out. Um, so it, it can, in a sense, serve as an ecological trap where it sort of tricks the insects into doing something during a season or a time that they should not be doing that. Um, so yeah, complicated subject, but but yeah, there's a lot still to learn on that side of things too. And I'm hoping that someone sort of figures more of that out. Okay. Well, um, I think that's all of the questions that anybody has uh, asked uh, here. Uh, very helpful during the migratory impact. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm dreaming up a, a walk and talk, Chris. I mean, do you think that that's a workshop we could do up here? When are we going to get you up here uh, for lunch, coffee, or do we want to do a, a walk and talk out in the wild and talk butterflies, moths, and all of that fun stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely happy. You're not. I'm happy to come out. You're not too far away. Um, I have been invited out on butterfly walks before and I always tell people that I am not a butterfly expert so embarrassingly enough like I can only identify a handful of butterflies um, okay. I'm much more, a moth walk. much more moth focused I mean yeah would that be an evening thing what would we do let's okay. let's dream that up yeah yeah there there's some possibilities so we can talk about it definitely cool um well everybody I, I'm sure everybody can agree that this was awesome that this will also be up on the youtube channel in the next couple of days and chris you'll let us know how long we can keep it up if you want to keep it up indefinitely we'd love to have your 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 resource up here uh, on our our youtube page which will also be accessible on our website um a reminder that i added some events to the chat box uh upcoming uh the next free thursday night event is going to be let's see so this is june july is going to be part two of phenomenal landscapes with jessica kung and on august the first thursday in august i am going to be speaking on redefining egocentric design uh be sure to check out the upcoming garden tour july 15th if you um want to join us for five garden gardens uh that designed by uh, studio petrichor uh, whole Systems Garden Designs on uh, just before the, the summer dormancy and uh, and have a delicious plant-based lunch over at our garden uh, at the end, um, sign up because that sold out pretty quickly last year. Um, Chris, thank you. Everybody, thank you for being here and have an awesome evening. Uh, thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>